Well, welcome to you all. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Marsha Connolly. I'm uh, the host for this event with uh, Tom Wood, Director of Trauma and Virtual Care at Bid Michigan Health Centers. Uh, I'll give a little introduction for Tom. He was raised in Sanford, Michigan, now lives in Midland. He received his Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Grand Valley State University, and then a Master's in Business from Northwood University. His uh, background is as an ER nurse, and he worked in several of the Southeast Michigan healthcare systems before joining MidMichigan Health Center in Midland in 2011. And there he was tasked with the chore uh, challenge to uh, build a level two trauma center there in their facility. And in 2015, those duties extended to oversee the creation of trauma centers at all of the MidMichigan Health Centers, including Alpena. Alpena is now a State of Michigan Level 3 Trauma Center in their licensing. So at that time, he was also tasked with the creation of a virtual care network for MidMichigan. And that's what he's going to review for us today, how telemedicine is going to be working for us now and in the future. Thank you very much, Tom, for joining us. Okay. Now, we're going to ask that our viewers uh, mute and keep those mutes on until they have a question for Tom. Otherwise, you can certainly use the chat function at the taskbar at the bottom of the screen but we'll be interested in learning about all of this as we go forward. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I, I lament that this is going on right now and I can't come to Alpena. It's the summer. Alpena is my favorite place to go to in the summer. It's beautiful up there. I, I, I love going to Alpena all the time though, because I love two things. I love water and I love hockey and Alpena has both in spades. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, Marcia, if anybody, uh, I don't have the chat box up the way it is. So if anybody has a question, if you could just flag to me, I'll pause. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I'm Tom, like she said, I'm the director of trauma and virtual care. I'm going to talk about virtual care today. Um, and I'll give a little background of some of the stuff we've done in, um, in Alpena and then, um, some of the stuff we're doing overall. Um, if there's any technical issues also just wave me down. It's, oh, it lost my video for a second there. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, you'll hear a lot of terminology that kind of gets interchanged when it comes to this topic, whether it's telemedicine or telehealth. We call our department virtual care here. Um, and so if you look at like what virtual care means, it's really just we're using technology to uh, deliver a myriad of health related services and information. So that includes things like telemedicine. Um, I'll talk about some of our initiatives like allowing you to virtually schedule how you can obtain test results in medical records virtually, how we do case conferences, which are with like multiple specialists and multiple doctors. Uh, all that stuff falls under the umbrella of virtual care and our department helps oversee and manage all of that. When I look at what we do in virtual care, I kind of think of it like ice cream. We have you know, kind of three flavors here to our cone. Um, we do work in the hospital. So if you were a patient admitted to the hospital, and getting your care there and you needed a specialist or some sort of service that isn't there at that facility, we use virtual care to do that. Um, so you can see some examples there. Are, uh, we do that for stroke in many places, including Alpena. We do that for neurology. We have some pharmacy programs. We do some addiction and recovery services and, and, and many, many others. Um, then we have the setting that we call the ambulatory office. And this is um, the regular outpatient office stuff like you would think of where you see your primary care doctor or a specialist outside of the hospital, but still inside of one of our buildings. Uh, so that would be like primary care. We do a lot of psychiatry. I will talk about this in a little bit, but Alpena absolutely leads the way in telepsychiatry for our health system and very likely much of Michigan. Uh, heart failure is something we, we is a recent one for us that we collaborate with the University of Michigan on. And again, just a litany of specialists that we use uh, up there. And I'll talk specifically about Alpena's in a second. And the last is what uh, you probably have really heard a lot about. I bet many of you have experienced it. 
in the last several months. And that's what we call our direct to consumer type of virtual care. Direct to consumer virtual care is when we use our technology to provide healthcare, but we do so outside of our brick and mortar facility. So for the most common type that you see of that, it is the patient in their home on a smartphone, tablet, or laptop or desktop getting care from a doctor without having to go to any mid-Michigan health facility. I gave a bunch of examples on this screen, but I'm gonna go through them in depth in a little bit. We do a lot of virtual care. This graph will kind of give that to you. So these are what we call our fiscal years. Our fiscal years go from July all the way through June. So we actually just finished fiscal 20. And as you can see, we've kind of had a little bit of a crazy growth. Uh, if you look back to fiscal 17, that's really where we invested heavily in virtual care. I'm very happy about that. It's something MidMichigan Health can be very proud of. We were investing in virtual care before it was a necessity. And, and I think what you'll see is that's what made us so adaptable and able to respond to COVID-19 in the way that we have and the way that we will continue to. Uh, back in that fiscal 17, we set a goal. We were gonna present, uh, or we were gonna take care for 2,000 people uh, virtually, having only done 48 the year before. We thought that was the biggest challenge we've ever faced. And then you can see our growth since then. And like I said, we actually still have some numbers to report because we just wrapped our fiscal year up, but we broke 50,000 last year. And we anticipate in fiscal 21, we will uh, achieve our 100,000th overall visit of patients. So very, very rapid growth. When we look at what virtual care does, we look at it from a, a wide angle. One of the ones I always like to highlight, and I, I do think is very specific to Alpena, you know, if we look at Alpena in terms of the rest of the MidMichigan Health Network and kind of just healthcare in general, Alpena can be very geographically isolated from many things. And one of the huge advantages of telehealth is that we can save patient travel miles. And this slide right here is just the patient. Um, it doesn't include, you know, if, if, if I lived in Alpena and my wife or my mother or one of my children were admitted in Midland or Ann Arbor or Traverse City or Petoskey, I'm still traveling as well, not just the, the ambulance ride for my loved one. And this is just that loved one. And we know from the time we founded our program to today, we've saved direct patients over a million miles of travel. And I like to put that, it's about 1.2 or 1.3 is our current number. Um, and I like to put that in perspective of, you know, that's 334 trips across the U.S., 40 around the world or four and a half times to the moon. Um, and, and that, we're, we're really proud of that. You know, I, I, I like, I grew up in a small town. It's Sanford, as she said. You probably heard of Sanford in the news. Things haven't been going so hot there. Our dam's blue. We lost our lake. A bunch of people's houses flooded and our town got destroyed. You know, we, we don't like to, when you're in a small town like that, it's our culture. It's our town. We, we, we know we don't have all the access to everything, but as much as we can, we like to stay local. And I appreciate that aspect of small towns or medium-sized towns that not everybody wants to go to a big city to be taken care of. So this is something I take a lot of pride in because it's kind of the way I was raised. Uh, just to give you an overview, we use a lot of stuff to do this. Um, multiple softwares, Epic is our medical record, you see it on there. Um, uh, VidYO is another one. If you've done in-home stuff with us, for the most part, over the last few months, you've used our Doxy service. I'll go over that in a little bit. These are just some pictures of stuff we use around the system. They range from extremely expensive carts over on the bottom left. That thing is 20 to 30,000 each, all the way through over on the right. That's an iPad, uh, iPad, iPad on an IV stand. And, and so those type of solutions, we cater them to where the patient is, what the staff needs and what the patient needs and what the provider needs to do a proper examination virtually. You can see kind of in the middle bottom there, we have our exam cam on the top picture there or a, steth a bell stethoscope on the bottom. We can listen to lungs. We can look at your eyes and your mouth and your ear and your nose. We can do all that virtually. Um, we are constantly evaluating our technology and constantly looking to uh, have cutting edge advances. So I wanna highlight uh, some stuff to start that specific, not specific to Alpena, but, but it, it exists in Alpena. Um, one cool thing I always like to put up here when I talk in Alpena, uh, we kind of had a, I don't know if it's a contest, but we were keeping an eye on who was going to be our 10,000th patient cared for by telehealth as a, um, as a health system and a virtual care program. And that actually occurred in Alpena. Um, and so we, uh, here it is, us enjoying the Alpena summer. We came up, 
we had a huge cookout outside. You can see in the bottom right, we even made Chuck make everybody food. Um, and we went through and, and anybody, everybody in, in, in the medical center, we gave them lunch, had them come out, played some, some games. Obviously, this was before a global pandemic, so we could sit next to each other without masks on. Um, and it was a good time. And I really like this. I like to highlight this slide because when I went to Chuck and said, you know, we'd like to do something. My actual idea is, you know, it was in your, uh, your behavioral health unit. I'd like to do something for the staff there. And Chuck's first response was, I'd like to do something for the entire hospital that participated in this. And he stepped up and, and financially supported it. You can see he was down there cooking. We even made him wear an apron. I don't know if you can really see that on there. Um, and that's just, I like to highlight those things because it really, it shows, you know, if there's one thing that Alpina does better than uh, all the other hospitals I visit, it is a true community medical center. I constantly hear my managers up there uh, and the administrators up there talk about the engagement in the Alpena community. And it's, it's something that I really admire in that culture up there. Talking specifically about our telestroke program. Uh, so our telestroke program exists in Alpena. It exists in all of our medical centers throughout uh, MidMichigan Health in both the emergency department and in the inpatient setting. So if you had a stroke and came in by ambulance or your family drove you in, you can get this service. Uh, you can also, if you were admitted to the hospital and something went south, you can have it uh, as well. This is a collaboration, like I said, with the University of Michigan. So that's Dr. Molly McDermott. She's the medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Program for the University of Michigan. She's also uh, our physician partner, and she brings her team up here. A and the nuts and bolts of it are, when you are wheeled into the emergency department in Alpena and you are having a stroke, you will be treated by the exact same doctor as if you were wheeled in to the emergency department of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, so you've got the Alpena emergency uh, doctor collaborating right there with the stroke doctors. They get on camera. This is a staged marketing photo. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea, but this is Molly's actual office. That's Dr. Montoya. He's a hospitalist in Midland and seeing a guy, Dennis, he's part of our neuro program. Uh, but this is what it looks like. Your medical record up on one screen, uh, the doctor and the patient care she can fully control the cart remotely. So if she wants to look at your eye, your nose, anything like that, she can take our camera. Our cameras are uh, capable of up to 25 times zoom. So basically from the end of your bed, she can get right in where the screen is just your eyeball and look at your pupil, um, which is an important part of a stroke evaluation. So uh, it's very complex. It works very well. As you can see, we did almost a thousand of them. This one is actually, it'll break a thousand. We're still waiting on the final um, July numbers, or sorry, June numbers for that. Um, and you can see in Alpena alone, there was 157 of them. Um, and we're, uh, we're very happy about those. We're very happy that they're everywhere. You know, Alpena, 157 is a good amount. You know, it's doing one every couple days. Uh, you know, we have some of our smaller facilities like uh, Gladwin. You know, Gladwin, the inpatient census of Gladwin might be two patients. And uh, those, those are, are complex specialties that would never, ever be available in that community without it. Um, on top of just the actual physical visits, we also work with the EMS agencies, the units uh, to help if you had to be, let's say you had to get a procedure because of your stroke that was not capable, capable of being done in Alpena, that transfer gets facilitated, the, the, the care continues. Um, you know, if you came to Midland, you'd have the U of M neurology team, which I'll talk about. It's all a very seamless process. We're very proud of it. We've received some recognition for this process in the past. I always like to highlight this really quickly. This is Sarah. Sarah is a case manager here in Midland. They actually had a stroke at work um, and came in not feeling well. Uh, eventually, when she was essentially not able to really function much anymore, they took her down to the ER. She had a telestroke visit with Ann Arbor uh, with, with Molly and her team. They found a really, really rare condition that was causing her stroke that needed super specialist intervention. So she was actually then transported down to U of M. The interesting thing with that is, although we weren't able to keep her here because she needed the procedure, she went down there and the doctor that had already been treating her in the ER in Midland was able to just to greet her there and continue their care in Ann Arbor. Sarah was able to make a full recovery. This is her back to work after her stroke. Um, the, the, uh, the condition she had was extremely serious and many people are not able to achieve the outcome she had because it's hard to detect. So we're very proud of that program. Uh, it was picked up by our local news. Actually, Sarah reached out to our marketing department in our program and said, you know, this did so much for me and it went so well. I would love to share my story. Um, so it ran in our Midland Daily News and then it was actually picked up by Beckers, which is a national uh, online health magazine that's very, very prominent in the, uh, in the world of healthcare. So we are very uh, proud of, of that story. 
The sister program to the stroke program is the neurology program. This is same thing, a collaboration with the University of Michigan. Uh, this is for, they will also see you after you've been admitted after your stroke, but they'll treat other neurology conditions like uh, TIAs, or you might know them as mini strokes, which are, um, you know, can have the, they kind of fluctuate. You'll get some of the stroke symptoms, then it resolves. I can have a litany of causes there, things like seizures, uh, other neurology conditions like that. This neurology team can keep people in their hospital and see them. Um, you know, Alpena has some access to neurology services uh, locally, and then some are done virtually. Obviously, as you can see, uh, 269 were done um, in Alpena. Uh, but there are also medical centers we have that don't have neurologists. Our Claire facility doesn't, our Gladman facility doesn't. And this allows those patients to, to get that neurology consult and not have to be transferred. A lot of times you could be in one of those facilities, you're admitted under the hospitalist, and they just need a neurologist input. It's not, you probably don't need a procedure or anything fancy done in that, that time, but that specialist input is needed. Traditionally, that patient would have had to be transferred to a Midland or to, to Flint or Detroit to get that neurology care. Now, that neurologist is able to see them give their recommendations over the chart, and then a lot of times the answer is, I need to follow up with them once this, this acute issue is settled down. I can see them on an outpatient, no need to transfer, stay in your community hospital, get your treatment from the doctors and the people you know, and we'll take care of you after this episode. Huge, um, huge advantage for us. I know I covered the miles traveled earlier. Uh, that, that is a, um, I have twins. They were born prematurely. We don't have a, a neonatal unit here in Midland. So even just over in Saginaw, which is 30 minutes away, they were in there for three weeks. The amount of traveling I had to do daily to go back and forth to see my children and my wife was inordinate. It put a huge strain on my life. So those sorts of things, they make me very proud of the program we have when we can keep people in their, 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 their home environment, close to their family, close to their home with people they know. We think that's a huge advantage of virtual care and something that we're always looking to expand. Behavioral health is um, uh, you know, something that's always a hot topic. You know, I think <laughs> if we think in the long, long ago before uh, COVID-19, you know, like four or five months ago, the behavioral health crisis was one of the most talked about health crises in America. Uh, and there's a severe shortage of all forms of behavioral health treatment, whether it's addiction services, you know, actual psychiatry care, uh, psychology care, uh, care management, pharmaceutical care, things like that. They're, they're, those are very short in the behavioral health space. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges around that. Alpena has always been ahead of the curve in this space. They lead the way for MidMichigan Health in virtual behavioral health care, that behavioral health unit. They, they now have some, um, uh, they have more on present site, but we still do a lot of virtual care. We do it in the hospital. We do it in the outpatient unit. Uh, we do it in the, um, uh, the uh, inpatient lockdown type unit where, where it's the involuntary stays. And we do direct to consumer virtual care where you can go right into your home. Um, we do, a, you know, one of the things we do there, it allows for the group approach. So we all know if you have a primary care doctor and let's just say a cardiologist, you go see your cardiologist, you go see your uh, primary care doctor, and those two happen in a silo versus what we can do now in a lot of these uh, behavioral health things, which is very important as you try to coordinate the care of the behavioral health patient. We can get multiple people on the camera at once that are caring for the patient and have a case conference with the patient so everybody's on the same page and nobody has to travel to do it. It's really easy to schedule. It's a click of a button. It's a huge advantage. And again, Alpena is our leader in this, and they are showing the rest of our health system how to do this right. I can't go into everything or uh, you hear me talk all day. We have a lot of other programs in Alpena. Uh, we have a, pharma a pharmacy program. It's an interesting program that we've created internally here at MidMichigan Health. If you've ever been admitted inpatient, they probably wheeled a virtual cart into your room and talk to you about the medications that you're taking. Um, I love this one as a former ER nurse because I used to have to do this as an ER nurse and, and it's complicated. Uh, but people have home medications and then they get acute medical conditions and when they come in the hospital, you can get your medications changed. Medications can interact poorly with each other or they can complement each other and get more of a reaction than what you want. A proper med history is extremely important and sometimes it can be really tough. As a former ER nurse, I can tell you, people used to bring like Meyer bags full of their medications and pill bottles in or they'd just be like, I don't know, I take a water pill. And we don't know what that is. The pharmacy techs have access to, to software uh, and pharmacy databases that can find those sorts of things that help our doctors care for the patient better. And in the end, when we did an internal study, we found that this reduced the potential for, for serious harm medication error by 
It's a huge safety feature that we've expanded to everywhere. Nephrology, kidney doctors, you can get that up in Alpena. Uh, we have thoracic surgery at the Long Rapids building uh, that if you've had thoracic surgery in Midland, you don't have to drive down for your post-op appointment. Uh, in many cases, you can go right to the Long Rapids facility and Dr. Avello Rivera will see you virtually from there. Um, we have a collaboration with the University of Michigan to do peds uh, to child uh, psychiatry. Um, our wound and ostomy nurse up there has access to, to virtually see their patients. Um, and then our obstetrics and gynecology department up there, uh, Dr. Conboy and his partners, um, do some post-op stuff, post-operative stuff. I'm going to talk there, uh, or I'm going I'm to stop and kind of transition here to give you some pre-COVID direct-to-consumer and then talk to you about how that factored into our COVID response, um, which I'm sure is kind of the hot topic uh, on most people's minds right now. I talked a little bit earlier about how we were very fortunate that some of the things we invested in early on panned out. <laughs> this is my elaborate drawing. I'm not an artist at all, so I had to do it in, like, I think this might have been Microsoft Paint or something like that. But this was, I'm a very visual guy. You're going to see a lot of pictures coming from this point on. And... What I was trying to show here back in 2017, as we were really getting into what does direct to consumer virtual care actually mean and what can we actually change? You know, I've long, it was around this time where I set the vision of our program is, you know, one of the ways, one of the things our program hopes to achieve is to redefine the way people access mid Michigan health. I do want to pause when I say that though and make something very clear. I, and I'm the director of virtual care. When virtual care is busy, I look better. I have zero interest in forcing somebody to use virtual care. I have no interest in taking somebody's ability away if they want to go physically see their doctor to do so. And none of that interest. If they want to call the office and schedule their visits, like always, totally fine with that. But for those people who want virtual care, I want them to have the maximal access to it. What I didn't know at the time when I set that vision is we were gonna be hit by a global pandemic where the only way you were gonna get care was through this. What I was depicting here is two sorts of things and two sorts of problems that we just had never been able to quite solve. And there are two truths that I believe are depicted by this graph and I still believe them to be true. One is that people don't always know how to access healthcare. When do I go to urgent care? When do I wait and call my doctor in the morning? When, what's, what about these borderline ED visits? Sure, we all know when we're having a heart attack or stroke or a severe breathing problem that I need to go to the emergency department. But there are times where it's like, I don't know, can this wait? And a lot of people we know just flat out don't know when to access the right level of resource. The other thing, I, and I, I got zero pushback when I pitched that. Where I got a little pushback, and I do believe to be true, and I think we're seeing a lot of this now through the pandemic, is that I'm not so sure we can get, we can teach enough to fix this problem. You know, to simply say, to put a pamphlet out or a phone, a recorded message out that says, hey, you know, if you're having some difficulty in breathing, but you're able to get through this, hold off. Don't go to the ER. I don't think we're ever going to be able to get there. And that's where I think virtual care could have a huge impact. And that's what I depicted on this slide, is that there would be times, notice the bottom line. The bottom line is what I was just saying a minute ago. If you want to directly access those things without going through virtual care, I have no interest in taking that away from you. You know, I will always take my kids to their annual pediatric exam because that's a hands-on exam and I want the doctor to see them. When they have strep throat, I don't care if they see them virtually. I, I, I prefer it virtually. I don't want to drag them out of, of, of the house. So there are times, when, and as I was depicting here, again, this was back in 2017, where we think, A, virtual care can help navigate you to those places and get you to the proper place, save you time. The analogy I'll give there is it's the difference between me giving you a map and sending you through a forest to get somewhere that I know how to navigate, or me saying, come with me, I'll walk you there. And virtual care is the come with me, I'll walk you through it so that you don't have to decipher how my health system works if you don't want to. Then on the top, what seemed like a radical idea at the time and is now kind of the way of life for many people right now is, well, what if we can use virtual care and resolve their acute issue, and now we've expanded to non-acute issues, and not have that patient ever enter any of these settings and stay in their home and stay in the community or stay at work. 
And that was a lot of what we put into. And I'm very proud to say that Mid Michigan Health committed to investing in that long before it was cool, uh, long before we had to do it to keep some of our patients cared for during a global pandemic. And it paid off just massively for us when COVID came along. We invested in uh, and, and put a whole team together. And this is our patient portal. If you are a patient and you have a mid-Michigan doctor, you should have a patient portal. This is a very powerful tool. It's the best way to communicate with your doctor, the best way to see your, your medical record. And I can assure you that me and my team are always pumping functionality in this to make your healthcare experience easier and more clear. Uh, our patient portal is available online. We call it our My Mid Michigan Portal. We have a helpline for it. You can talk at next, your next appointment. Just say, I want a portal account if you don't have it. They can get you hooked up with it. I can't overstate the value to patients and your family members should you, you know, I'm the nurse, the family nurse. So every time one of my aunts or uncles or cousins or, or their extended network of friends has a medical question, I'm the one they call. Um, as a family member, I have two uncles right now who have cancer. They don't know how to navigate the health system. And they're able to say, I proxy Tom into my patient portal. I want him to read what my doctors are up to and help me figure out what they're saying and what they do next. This tool is exceptional for that. So there's my sales pitch on the portal. We can do a lot of things through the portal. And these are some of the things we were doing prior to COVID. We were giving people the ability to schedule their own doctor. This is my portal. This is screenshots from my phone when I was on it. Um, you can see Dr. Qureshi. She's one of the residents here. She's my primary care doctor. Um, and this is the exact screens. I, I said, I want to have an appointment. I picked Dr. Qureshi. I said, I need uh, an office visit. And then I said, here's the day I want. And it popped up some dates. I know it looks like, hey, you searched on uh, the, uh, February 10th and it didn't come up through March. It's because I was looking for annual physical and that I wasn't due for one since then. So it was giving me a month delay because we built that in. But this is how easy it is. Had I clicked the 1.30 p.m. button on March 3rd, Boom, appointment scheduled, everything ready to go. I can, and, and the advantage of that for many people, um, especially those uh, who maybe work off shifts and things like that, is I could be laying in bed at midnight doing this. I don't have to wait till the office is open or remember when the office is open. I can do this for an acute visit. So I woke up in the morning with a sore throat, a new cough, a runny nose, or my child did, or my loved one did, and I need them to be seen. I can put that type of visit in there, or I can do a follow-up visit. You know, I was admitted to the hospital and they told me to follow up with my primary care doctor. I can tell them all that stuff right through the portal. And once I click that little time button, it'll give me a little box to say, do you want to give us a reason why you're coming in? So you can put that stuff in. Um, we also know Alpena does not have an urgent care. They have the walk-in clinic and we're working around stuff with that. Our MidMichigan Health Urgent Cares, we created the ability to do what's called direct scheduling in there. Um, and I, I love this functionality. Think about, you know, uh, when you go to a walk-in clinic or you go to an urgent care, you never know how long you're going to wait. And sure, I post wait times of that on our website. We do it as best we can. I go and I look, it's, it's nine in the morning and there's a two hour wait in the Midland uh, urgent care. I can say, all right, I got to leave work right now. I've got to go sit in the hard plastic chair for two hours. Hope that that prediction of time is accurate. Then I'll get back and then I'll finally be able to get back to work minimum three hours later, plus travel time. In this program, what they can do is say, ooh, there's a wait, but I can go, I can reserve right now at two or 4 p.m. that I can walk into that urgent care 15 minutes before it, and I'll get an appointment as if I was going to my primary care doctor. And that's a, a functionality that we put in, we tested in Midland, um, we're expanding throughout the system. We are figuring out what to do with the Alpino walk-in clinic uh, when it comes to that. You know, we find, that a lot of people who go to urgent care, they just need to be seen that day. It's not that I needed to be seen that hour. You know, some people, if you have a big goopy pink eye and stuff like that, you're not gonna really stick around. But sometimes, you know, if my ear is impacted with earwax or something like that, you know, it's not debilitating. I know it needs to get taken care of. And if I just know you'll see me at two this afternoon and I couldn't get into my primary care doctor, I'm fine with that. And I can avoid waiting the multiple hours in the waiting room. This was our closest thing we were doing to um, our COVID clinic uh, prior to COVID. And this was an example I give of um, what a normal surgery after visit looks like. So now you've had your surgery and you're back, uh, uh, back at the doctor to get your follow-up visit. And this is the best case scenario. I would challenge many people to identify a time that 
from the time they left their house to the time they returned, they got back in 75 minutes when they went and saw the surgeon. But this is if every phase hit perfectly and we know it doesn't. So I want you to picture that you had your gallbladder out or you had your appendix out, some form of a minor general surgery procedure. And now you're back to the office. Now that post-op appointment is generally 10 to 14 days after surgery. Many people who get their gallbladder out are back to work within five or six days. So think about that. You're back to work. You're already back to work. What are the odds that you have a debilitating complication, complication or a complication that requires any intervention from your doctor if you are able to go back to work? Realistically, what are you going to get if you have a complication from, let's say, your gallbladder being removed? The most common one, and it's still extraordinarily rare, would be like a surgical site infection. So what does that manifest as? Well, I might have pain or brightness or oozing and drainage at the wound. I might have a fever. It might have swelling or just not look right. Am I really going to sit around for 10 to 14 days and be like, well, I have a fever and there's pus coming out of my incision, but I'm going to go see Dr. Thornton here in two weeks. So I'm just going to hang out. Nobody waits for that. So they're already getting that resolved in another way. And that's, a, that's less than 1% of patients. So the, but yet, we made 100% of patients come to that office for their post-op visit. And we, that didn't feel right. So we sat down and said, well, what can we do differently? So, and I want to highlight another thing here. At most surgeons' office, you're doing all of that to see your surgeon for a max of seven and a half minutes. When we did on-site evaluations and time studies, it was usually about three minutes. And most people were taking a half day of work to do it. Half day of work to see a surgeon for three minutes when you know you don't have a complication. That's what we went to address. We addressed it two ways. One, we created a video visit for some of the more complex uh, patients that, that needed it. And for some patients who said, you know, I'm not quite ready to not interact with my doctor at all. We made the video visit option. The video visits don't take 15 minutes. Again, this is if everything took the maximum amount of time. Our normal video visit lasts between six and 10 minutes. Um, the last is the e-visit. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. That's a template uh, that you can do anytime you want. It gets sent to you once you're 10 days post-op. You fill out a couple yes, no questions. You can attach a picture of your incision. You send it to your doctor. They review it. They send you back. It all goes in your medical record. This is that template. This is, if you had your gallbladder out and you chose this option, this is what you'd get. You can see on the left-hand side, some yes, no questions. Starting again, continuing on the right-hand side. Gives you a spot to type in if you've got any concern. Gives you a spot to attach a picture. Those last questions down there, those are actually part of a national and state quality collaborative um, that, that really specifically uh, focuses on satisfaction and then really is looking at quality of life and opioid use um, as we combat the opioid epidemic uh, going on in the United States. Um, this is that template. It takes our patients a few minutes to fill out. It takes the doctor a few minutes uh, to do that. We have seen zero bounce backs from this. A bounce back would be somebody who fills this out and we miss the complication and they end up back in the surgeon office or they end up in the ED. We've, we haven't had an instance of that. This has been live for well over a year. Um, I wanna say it went live in April or March of 2019. Um, so uh, we've, we've got that rolling right now. Um, you know, certainly an option. Again, I always continue to say this. If you want to go see your surgeon after the appointment, we don't take that ability away. The other thing I really like about this is I, I, I can do this, at, you know, I'm laying in bed, uh, it's a Tuesday, it's after work, I can fill it out, I can fill it out from my desk and I don't have to miss a half day at work. Video visits offer us a lot of that same flexibility. The major flexibility difference between that template I showed you and this is a video visit still has to occur during regular vis business hours. I can tell you people call in from these from their desk at work, their couch at home, um, in their car. We don't let them do it if they're driving. I am the trauma director. That's a very bad idea. Uh, we've had people be passengers in cars or pull over into a parking lot and do their visit. This is an example of if you do that visit through the patient portal. Um, some of our doctors do do this. We are moving away from this uh, is a lesson we've learned from COVID and using other functionality. And I'll show you that. But this is how simple it is. You come into your, your portal. The opening screen says, hey, by the way, I see you have a video visit. Click this button. Now click the button to begin your video visit. And this is a, a generic screenshot on the right. Um, it's tough to get actual examples because I don't want to violate any patient's privacy and, and take pictures of them during their visit. So we just use staged examples. Um, it's what shows you what it looks like on the smartphone. It looks just like that. 
Lastly, um, what we were doing before COVID is a program called e-consults. Um, and e-consults are the idea that you can keep you out of specialist office. So uh, you have seen my primary care doctor, maybe I have diabetes, my primary care doctor is managing my diabetes, it's starting not to go so well, or maybe I need a little advanced management. And normally they would refer me to an endocrinologist. This gives in some of those situations, the primary care doctor, the ability to fill out a predetermined template that will then send off to the endocrinologist for input. And then the endocrinologist looks at it and says, you know what, try this, this, and this, and continue to manage the patient. Or, yeah, that's a little complex, send them to my office. Nationally, we see an 80% resolution through the e-consult, meaning that patient did not have to go see a separate specialist and gets to continue to be managed at this time by their primary care doctor who they've been working with all along. We are rolling these out in many specialties right now. This is more in the pilot phase. We were really close to blowing this up and then COVID hit. Uh, so we picked this back up. I have templates built for um, cardiology, endocrinology, psychiatry, and we are working on neurology right now. You will see this coming to Alpena in the near future. Let me transition to COVID-19. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I put this out there. This is an article I wrote uh, and that got published um, about what COVID-19 did to virtual care um, and uh, some of the things that changed that need to never go back. Um, and that's kind of in the phase that we're at right now. I can tell you some massive um, problems that we face. One of the biggest things that inhibits innovation in the virtual care and healthcare space overall is government regulation and insurance company willingness to pay. Those things got essentially discarded during um, uh, the coronavirus original outbreak. Um, I have a lot of thoughts around that. If you want to hear about them, I wrote them in that article and I'm happy to send you a link, but um, I would go on a rant for about two hours if you got me going on it. So, uh, Here's where we're facing. So, um, you know, this is probably a week and a half before the governor's shutdown order. Uh, we were seeing cases spike. We saw our colleagues and friends down in Metro Detroit. I came here from Beaumont. Um, and as you probably know through the news, Beaumont was one of the hardest hit organizations. So my Facebook was flooded with my former coworkers and, um, and what their hospital looked like as a disaster. It was disastrous and all their ventilators being full and things like that. And, and we didn't know, you know, we didn't know was our turn right around the corner and is it already here? So we were facing that our urgent cares and emergency departments were being overwhelmed with patients. I mean, testing is still getting improved, but back then it was horrifically limited. We, we couldn't get testing supplies to the level that we wanted them. The CDC was changing criteria for who gets tested every day. Not everybody had a patient portal and you saw a lot of the stuff we were doing was through the portal, so I couldn't reach them. Um, you know, the ones that did, we could find some stuff. One of the things, so I can't get too deep into it because it would take too long, but the government really restricts what we can use to do telehealth with. So take an Apple user, for example, and Apple's kind of a gray area, but it's easy just to use this way. You know, prior to COVID, they would tell me, I can't use FaceTime to connect with you because they would say it's not HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is the privacy uh, act that everybody might be familiar with. You have to sign a HIPAA thing at your doctor quite often. Um, you know, I've always wondered what a hacker has to gain uh, by hearing that my child has strep throat, but uh, the government said we can't use it. Um, and so what we were really facing is consumer stuff that you use every day to communicate with your loved ones um, and that the consumers are used to, they're not allowed to use them for virtual care. So now patients have to learn a whole new application, download new apps, and they don't work on every device. You know, we tried, I think I go into this a little bit, we tried Skype, FaceTime, Google Chats, Zoom, GoToMeeting, all these things, and every one of them had fatal flaws that we could not get around. Um, I should preface, and I'll show you in this picture, we were given six days, six days to go from, hey, we need something, to, hey, I need it available to everybody in the entire MidMichigan Healthcare Network. And this is what we did. We created a thing called the Telehub. The Telehub is a virtual COVID clinic. And what we did is we, uh, you can see here, this is kind of the pictures. I knew when we were doing this, if it was successful, it was gonna be a great story. And if it was a failure, it would show that I tried. Um, so uh, top left, you see there, that's my handwriting. It's terrible, I know. Um, actually, that, that grease board is also my, my handwriting. Uh, and, and this is where we went. It's just, what do we do? How do we do it? Okay, it's on a piece of paper. 
Now, step by step, how does a patient go? If you go all the way from the top left, a patient calls and says, I think I need something, all the way through the bottom right where it says, visit complete and do they need testing? Yes, no, and how do we tie into that? You can see as you go to the bottom left, that's my RN analyst, Ashley, uh, looking at it from the clinical perspective. Where do we need technologies? Where do our current technologies fail? Where will patients struggle? All those sorts of things we had to think through. Uh, the, the middle right, again, before uh, social distancing mandates and things like that, uh, they were still coming out at this time. Uh, you know, that's our every, I want to say it was either 6.30 or 7 o'clock every single morning. You know, all the way from the gentleman in the back closest to the door, that's Paul Berg. He's the president of the physician company. Um, you know, the gentleman all the way to the right in that picture is Pankaj Janwani. He's our chief of innovation. And we, um, you know, we sat there uh, um, every morning going through these algorithms and so how do we do it? Getting everybody on the same page. We ended up taking over a practice called our East End Clinic here in Midland. It's a primary care office that had a provider leave shortly before it. So it, was, it had a, a wing of it empty. So we decided to create a centralized place where our team would be. So we would bring doctors into that clinic. So we'd set up a phone, uh, a phone triage. My team would be there to technically support. I had to, you can see in that bottom right picture, those are people wiring the internet, increasing the broadband speed, running phones all over the place, all these sorts of things. We had to do this in six days. Um, that's our team. That's our command center. Um, I think you can see how uh, fun it was at the time by judging the amount of coffee on the table and how much we were working at that time. I told you we had a lot of problems finding an app. We discovered this called doxy.me. I, I mean, people think I'm crazy when I say this. We discovered and tested and validated doxy.me at about two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, and we opened our entire telehub clinic at 8 a.m. Thursday morning. Um, we had had the, the regulations were lifted during this time. Uh, doxy, it, 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 like a, doxy is beautiful in a few things. One, absolutely no app to download. No, uh, no account needs to be created. It works across a plethora of devices. You know, uh, uh, if you're an Android user, you're difficult to get a hold of. Uh, Apple does very well in these spaces. Uh, an Android is tough. Um, and, I, and I can say that I have both Apple and Android. So, you know, I'm kind of just sitting on the fence. Um, Doxy, if you haven't used it, texts you or emails you a link. You click it. It takes you to a room. You hit two buttons and type your name in and boom, you're in it. This is a picture of my Doxy room as an administrator. Well, you can see where it says John Doe there. Um, that's the virtual waiting room. So I know you're there. I know how long you've been there. If I were to have hovered over it, it would say start call. The minute I click that, it puts us together and we're on the call. You didn't download anything. Nothing is saved on your phone. My providers use this uh, on one screen or a smartphone or a tablet. And then they have your actual medical record up right in front of them. And, that, and, the, and the visit is conducted in that manner. Um, very, very successful using this. Um, like there is a failure rate. There's a failure rate in all virtual visits. I will tell you the absolute number one reasons that we can audit and see our virtual visit fail is lack of connection on the patient side. Here's some pictures of what we did. That is the East End Clinic in the top left. I think that's at like four in the morning, the day we opened the telehub. To give you an idea of what it takes to put that sort of clinic together in six days is the middle upper picture. Uh, that's our team. That's actually our lunch meeting. If you look at Ashley kind of in the middle, there's a, a thing there. That's us doing a rapid cycle performance improvement. What's going well? What's not? What are we changing going into the second half of the day? It's just how you have to do it in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, that picture in the right, that's our call center. So when we let the 800 number out or a doctor's office referred you, you went right to there. They created a chart for you, got you on our patient portal, got all your information, and you went right into the visit. The bottom left is our elaborate training method. Uh, this is Dana's about to pick up her first patient. And uh, I'm at her side saying, click here, click here, click here, and then trying to run off the screen before the patient comes on camera and asks, who's that guy? Um, in the middle, that's Dr. Shannon Martin. She's the chief of primary care medicine here at MidMichigan Health. That's her seeing our first ever patient uh, through our telehub process and through Doxy. And on the bottom right is Dr. Paul Berg. Like I mentioned him earlier. He's the president of our entire physician enterprise. He was obviously very vested in it. He's a primary care doctor by background. Um, and so he was right there day one to support the team. And then he's like, well, I might as well see patients while I'm here and started seeing patients. Here's the outcomes we had from Telehub. The Telehub, as I just described, is closed right now. Volume certainly decreased. Um, we opened it from uh, the 19th of March through June 10th. 
Uh, now it goes through a nursing triage line that can help navigate you still. So we still have functionality out there. We treated over 2,700 patients. 70% of them were able to be resolved virtually without leaving their house. Um, you know, those are 70% of people that didn't have to go to an urgent care, their primary care, risk exposure. This was in the shelter in place stuff. Uh, it complied with social distancing, all that. Very proud of that. We seamless, for the 30% that didn't need to be tested, we seamlessly integrated them with our ambulatory testing sites throughout the healthcare network, including in Alpena, where then when the patient showed up, they already had a chart, they already had an order, they showed up. Uh, in many of the places, you rolled the window down your car, they put that swab in for any of you who've been tested, it, like the nasal swab, it like goes back to your brain. Uh, get that in there. Um, and the other key thing at this time, again, I can't hi uh, highlight enough, the, the guidelines were constantly changing, constantly changing daily by the CDC of who gets tested as we learn more. By having that centralized telehub approach, we were able to every morning update and make sure that we were compliant and best practice CDC guidelines. At that time, so it was six days later, then we're like, well, how does every patient out there get a virtual visit for their regular healthcare? You know, high blood pressure didn't stop happening because COVID occurred. And, and so how did we get those visits in there? Patients needed primary care and they needed specialty care. And now our offices were, were closed. They were all closed. Um, so we opened the telehub on a Thursday. On that Friday, we opened our first ambulatory office. It was our psychiatry practice. Psychiatry works very well in virtual care because it's a dialogue. You know, there's not a physical exam component to almost any of it. So uh, we went there and did that. We set up PCPs and specialists all throughout the system. You know, I really like to show these pictures to say, you know, right now, if you come to me with a plan to this, you'd get some elaborate Gantt chart and plan. This is what it looked like. Check marks on a grease board. And there's a list over there. That's called our live list. Those are just the names of the clinics that were live. A week later, we had two or three of those sheets full. Here are our outcomes. Um, through June, I didn't put anything past June, we conducted over 23,000 of those virtual visits in the ambulatory space. They are still offered today. We have over 300 providers, including many providers in Alpena, throughout the entire health system. Um, and, and the big key, there's two key, it was able to keep some semblance of normal life and it was really key. This, after psychiatry, the next place I implemented was oncology. I can't imagine, well, I can't, I guess I talked to my uncle, he kind of told me about it, but I can't imagine the fear it must have been through an actively immunocompromised cancer patient going through chemotherapy when coronavirus first hit. And it probably is still today. This gave us the ability for those highly vulnerable populations, you know, immunodeficient people of all kinds, to see their providers without risking exposure to the public. Um, and that was a huge mission of ours. We, um, we started with those high risk clinics and then uh, went on from there. And um, we're, we're very proud of the work. And again, that continues today. So what's next? Honestly, in many aspects, I don't know. Uh, there are government restrictions and insurance issues that have been um, discarded uh, for coronavirus and are threatening to come back. They severely inhibit the way we can do a lot of care. Primarily, prior to coronavirus, no insurance, not, I won't say no, very, very, very small amounts of virtual care would be covered by any insurance company if it was done in your home. They would not recognize the place of home as a place of service. That was expanded and, and, and put in place during COVID-19's original surge. Some of these government restriction expansions are, set, are due to expire in August 4th. There is obviously a massive push to continue them. The pandemic period is still ongoing in most of our areas. It doesn't impact Alpena as much, but another major restriction is that telehealth for the most part prior to COVID is only paid for in a rural area. So you have to have a health provider shortage area designation. We call that a HIPSA. And if you're not a HIPSA area, they won't pay for it even in the hospital, except in some cases like stroke. That means in, in places like Midland, they wouldn't reimburse any of our telehealth. Um, the government restrictions, I'm not as worried about those uh, because our doxy service is fully HIPAA compliant, it's secure, everything like that. Um, I, I will just tell you from my personal opinion, many of the restrictions around telehealth are nonsense um, and they're antiquated. And so we are hoping those don't come back. We have to identify what the new normal is um, and if there is even such a thing as a new normal. What is the right mix? of virtual care and in-person care and physically you know, present care. 
Uh, we're still identifying that. We have some teams working around that, particularly in the behavioral health space right now. We, you know, we have to be vigilant and prepared for a second wave. Um, and will our, what if one of our areas look more like what Metro Detroit looked like? What does that look like? And then honestly, meeting that new demand, people were exposed to telehealth. We get a lot of people saying, I don't want to go back. And how do we continue through that? Here's a couple of things that are very specifically in the works right now. Symptom specific e-visits are that template I showed you earlier, except for an acute visit. So let's say I have a urinary tract infection and I don't want to go into an urgent care and it's two in the morning. I can go online and fill out that template. We, uh, there's best practice algorithms in many of these scenarios right through my patient portal. It goes to a pool of doctors. They can look at it and give me a response, call my prescription. And then, and, uh, you know, I'll just be honest, our fee for that is $25. Uh, and most, we are billing insurance and many insurances will cover it. Uh, we're, we're continuing to look at expansion of e-consults. We're upgrading our equipment and uh, connections. We've got a big project going on that. I mentioned the expansion of uh, portal functionality. And then we're really focused right now on getting a lot of supportive services into video visits, like care coordinators, non-physician non stuff. I know I went through a lot there. Um, I thank you for allowing me uh, to come. This is my family. Uh, uh, you know, uh, proving that we're mask compliant in many aspects. Uh, and so, you know, I always say I work to have a life outside of work. And uh, these are uh, these are the people that make my world go around. And I always like to share them in my presentation. So. I really appreciate you having me today and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tom. Tom, Tom this is uh, Dick Bremer. Uh, you mentioned you had a link to an article that you wrote. Uh, could you just send that to Marsha and we'll make it available with our video? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Good. Whoops, we have something in chat. Let's see. Oh, it's a thank you from Ron Young to everyone. Great program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, from my perspective of having implemented big projects, I'll have to say, wow, Tom, that was quite a uh, <laughs> effort you went through on implementation of your uh, program there. Holy mackerel. <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I, I've said oftentimes internally here, it's something our organization should be very proud of. It really showed what happens when there's top-down alignment in what's our mission and what's our goal, and everybody's on the same page and communication flows well. Uh, it's something to be very proud of. Any other questions? And another from Ron Young, pretty amazing accomplishment. Yes, indeed. It's a nice fish he has there. <laughs> so uh, this is Dick Bremer. This is Dick Bremer again. I, I used the telemed with my doctor about six weeks ago. Are things different now than they were six weeks ago? Um, right now, almost all of our clinics that were using Doxy are still using Doxy. Uh, the only thing that may have changed is if you were in a clinic that was doing it through the portal. We are transitioning most of those to our Doxy client, the one that texts you, simply because it is much easier to do across patient devices. And we, our patient feedback of those who have done both was the preferable to Doxy because it has just a simple link click, link click for people. Um, our interest as a program is to never go back, never go back to the way we used to do, to, to the... Never go back to not being able to offering the services that we're able to offer right now. Um, I know I've hit this a bunch of times. We are very dependent on what the government and what our insurance companies decide to do with us. Um, we are hoping that they have seen the advantages of providing this care to people. Um, and we fully know, I, I can't emphasize enough, I fully know there's some people who, who did the virtual stuff because they had to and they hated it and they won't come back. That's okay. I mean, I think in America these days, you've won if you can make 51% of people happy. Um, our goal is a lot more than that. However, again, I have no interest in taking you, your ability to go to your doctor away. I do want to be there for you if you want to use us. No, I think your use of an uh, of, uh, interface that doesn't require any downloading onto a person's device, that's a very positive step. Yeah, we, it, that was a huge, huge reason for us. And its ability to function 
on Google device, Android device, Apple devices. It's huge. We, I never would have thought we'd run into such difficulty finding a device like that or finding an application like that. Any other concerns, questions, comments? Well, thank you very much, Tom. You provided us a, a great deal of information and probably many more questions about the future. Uh, well, if they ever get answered, I'm happy to come back. <laughs> oh, we'll look forward to that. Good. Thank right. you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you thank so you. much.